Difficult conversations are inevitable when you're an adult, and it may be especially true for school leaders. The best way to prepare for productive outcomes is to practice communication strategies over and over again, so that when you are faced with an emotionally charged conversation, you have developed skills to help move the conversation forward. First, let's remember why your leadership role as principal is so important. Teacher quality has a larger impact on learning than any other factor. And as principals, you have more influence over effective instructional practice and support to teachers and other professionals than leaders at the district office, parents, community members, or anyone else. Students who are placed with highly effective teachers for three years in a row significantly outperform average students. A student who has an outstanding teacher for just one year will remain ahead of their peers for the next few years. Unfortunately, the opposite is true as well. A student with even one ineffective teacher may not catch up to his peers for up to three years, and having one excellent teacher doesn't fully compensate for the effect of an ineffective one. Worse yet, students with three ineffective teachers in a row rarely catch up at all. Grunert and Whitaker state in their book, School Culture Rewired, that it matters what leaders do or don't do. They go on to state that the culture of any organization is shaped by the worst behavior the leader is willing to tolerate. While it might be true that when you visit classrooms at your school, you may observe mostly effective teaching practices, however, you may likely encounter ineffective practice at some point in your career. If you have a serious concern about a teacher's instruction, then your main fear should not be the conversation with the teacher, but what happens to students if we don't have that conversation? No one looks forward to potential confrontation or emotional responses. You will likely experience an emotional response when you encounter ineffective practices. The key is to have a plan and practice the plan. So when you feel emotions start to creep in, remember these three strategies. First, stay curious and not judgmental. Second, focus on a third point, standards or a framework to depersonalize the conversation. And lastly, practice actively listening. So what might it look like to stay curious? Well, these kinds of situations happen all the time. Someone behaves in a way that triggers negative emotions, an irate parent, a disgruntled coaching staff, or observing ineffective practice from a teacher. All can trigger an emotional response. So how do you keep a curious mindset when faced with these situations? I find it quite easy to feel curious about the physics of space exploration or the mesmerizing flight patterns of starlings but I struggle to conjure up that same feeling of curiosity when I see human behavior that I don't understand, especially when the situation involves me personally. Emotions cloud professional judgment. Reframing an initial negative thought by staying curious is difficult. However, an initial emotional reaction is not likely to promote change or growth. Asking a question out of genuine concern creates a safe space for the teacher to be honest about his or her struggle. Take the opportunity to show support for the teacher's well-being while also communicating the need for modeling respect and rapport with students. So then one strategy to use when you feel emotions getting in the way of progress, remind yourself to adopt a mindset of curiosity instead of judgment. Give yourself time to gather more information before jumping to conclusions. A second strategy for neutralizing the potential for emotional reactions is to shift the focus to a third point. It's important that the third point provides an agreed upon expectation or expectations. During a post-observation meeting, for example, consider centering the conversation around the predetermined standards or rubric for performance. For a different conversation, the third point might be the student handbook or discipline code. Again, the third point must not be surprise information. Instead, it is a known framework, rubric, or standards that are known to both parties well in advance of the difficult conversation. Note the physical focus is on the third point and not on each other, which enhances the ability to comment in an impersonal way when referenced. 
An additional nuance in using a third point is to intentionally place the resource between and out from the parties in order to provide a safe place psychologically. Consider a post-observation conversation. The use of the third point is very productive when talking about where pieces of evidence from an observation might align to the framework. You might ask the teacher to identify differences between level descriptors in the critical attributes section. For example, a teacher may believe that the class discussion aligned with accomplished or exemplary because the students answered high level questions. However, when the teacher was asked to take a look at the framework and read through the language around discussion techniques, she noticed that while the questions themselves were high level, she did not provide the opportunity for students to respond to one another. Combining the evidence with the third point, in this case, the language of the framework, allows for self-reflection without opinions or biases clouding the conversation. While still uncomfortable, the conversation might not be halted by defensiveness. So far, we've addressed two strategies for engaging in productive, difficult conversations. Embrace curiosity and attend to, thir to a third point. Active listening is the most difficult and possibly the most effective way to move forward in critical conversations. Robert Garmston is the co-developer of cognitive coaching, and he describes three important set-asides to enable active listening. The first set-aside is solution listening. It's normal to want to think of possible solutions to another person's problem, yet it's not likely to be productive. Time pressures in schools accelerates this tendency. However, leaders cannot deeply understand the communications of others if he or she is internally formulating a solution and rehearsing a best way of saying it. Set aside your solutions or advice and practice listening to learn instead. A second set aside is inquisitive listening. This is what happens when asking questions about details can take away from the main idea the speaker is trying to get across. A quick example, a teacher is sharing about a negative parent conversation and all she wants to do is get the situation off her chest and out of her head, but she keeps being interrupted with questions about the behavior incident. When did it happen? What consequences did the student have? Well, what was the name of the other student who was involved? And the teacher leaves feeling unsatisfied and unheard. Hold on to your detailed questions and set them aside. Instead, practice listening to learn. And the third set aside for listening is autobiographical listening. This often happens so inherently that it may be difficult to recognize as something negative, an action to set aside for the sake of active listening. As listeners, we want so much to show that we connect, that we understand what another person is going through by relating their story to one of our own. You might be listening to someone talking about a real struggle they are having, and your mind is connecting the dots to a situation of your own, and you think, you know, even though I have never quite experienced his situation from his vantage point, I'm sure if I butt in and share my personal story, we will share a mutual connection. Well, that's unlikely. Moreover, you can't be actively listening if you are already practicing your own storytelling in your head. Let go of the need to tell a similar story. Listen to learn instead. So then, how do we practice active listening, especially when faced with a difficult situation in which emotions have already crept into play. First, show genuine concern and interest in the other person's viewpoint by asking them to share their thinking. If you sense that the person expressing emotions, acknowledge one. You may find that the other person's guard is lowered simply by acknowledging their feelings. And to show that you've been listening, paraphrase what was said without simply parroting back their own words. And I'll tell you, this does take practice. So let's consider an example. A teacher comes to your office and says, I do not understand why you're asking us teachers to basically work 12 hour days. I have my in-person students work to grade, lesson plans for both in-person and online students, and students are emailing me at all times of the night asking for their questions to be answered right then. I feel like I'm doing double the work, but students are learning half as much as they should. This is ridiculous. Okay, so instead of responding to the emotional statement the teacher made at the onset, of course you aren't asking teachers to work 12 hour days. Instead, identify and acknowledge one emotion. 
you might say, you're frustrated. So notice that I didn't say, I understand that you're frustrated. You know, keep it about the other person and not you. All you have to do is just acknowledge an emotion. Then follow up with why the teacher might be frustrated with a brief paraphrase. You're frustrated because on one hand, you're concerned about student learning, while on the other hand, you feel like your plate is just too full. Now, at this point, you might even choose to take a stab at a preliminary goal statement, such as, and what you want is to be successful in teaching all students during the course of the school day so that you can enjoy some downtime when you're home. Now, you've set the stage for a more productive conversation, and you can follow up with questions that lead to the teacher beginning to identify strategies that she might try. The important part is that you listened and you demonstrated your listening skills by acknowledging the emotion, paraphrasing what you heard, and then creating a pathway for resolving the problem. Now, notice also what you didn't do in this scenario. What you didn't do is become defensive. You didn't offer your advice. You didn't trivialize her situation. And you didn't one-up her by sharing your own time management issues. So essentially, you built trust by demonstrating that what she is experiencing matters. Your job as the leader is not to solve your teacher's problems. You're not, you're not going to solve her problems for her. Your job is to empower. You're simply providing the support for her to access her own resourcefulness. So stay tuned because we will offer more learning opportunities about the power of paraphrasing and pausing in any conversation in our um, P3 events to come. Also, if you would like to study more on your own about productive conversations, even in the face of adversity, I recommend choosing one of the following books or find another choice that you like better. Download an audible file and listen as you drive to and from work if you want. If you'd like to learn in collaboration with colleagues, then I invite you to join our P3 mailing list by visiting our Principal Partnership Project Google site. We will keep you posted about upcoming remote learning opportunities designed for you, the principal or assistant principal, and you won't even have to leave your office. This is Jenny Ray. Thanks for joining.